paper, we're going to talk about fitness landscapes. And so I thought I would introduce the concept here. So the idea is uh, that the fitness landscape is going to look something like this. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, on the uh, axis over here, you're going to have fitness, which is basically how many offspring you're going to leave behind. And so you see we've got some peaks up here where, and so each of these peaks is in what we would call sequence space. So imagine this is a particular combination of, you know, um, uh, 30,000 nucleotides to make a coronavirus or uh, 15,000 nucleotides to make something like HIV. And so if you mutate, you're going to move off in a different direction. So in reality, this sequence space, if you're actually making it, would have a lot more dimensions than would be easy for us to view by eye. But we're going to pretend that it's just going to be two-dimensional. And so if you're making a mutation, you're going to go, um, let's say, one little square in some direction. And so like from here down to here, we're making one, two, three mutations. And uh, so you can see if you started out at the top of a hill and you make mutations, you're pretty much going to go downhill. That's just the way it is. And look what's in between each of these uh, peaks. At the peak, you're going to leave behind lots of offspring. But as you mutate, say you want to go from this peak over to this peak, you'll mutate. And if you go one step at a time, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you're going to go through down here, which is basically the valley of death. This is the area where you're not going to have very many offspring, and you're basically not going to get through it. So you can't just go step by step. This is why simple mutation does not make for good viruses or good anything biological. What you need to do is figure out a way to jump from one peak to another peak. So the dengue virus is able to do this by carrying all its mutations on a separate copy. So we'll have one copy that stays up here at the top, and it'll have a second copy that is going to pay the price. And it's going to actually go down through the valley. But because these two work together, this one at the top can actually copy the one that's down at the bottom without even realizing it's doing this, of course. And uh, eventually, when the uh, other one emerges on another peak, then bam, it can come back and it can be its own strain and uh, it can help out another virus. And so the virus is able to move. Now, the virus has no idea what the landscape looks like. It finds this by just sort of making mutations around where it is. So most viruses are going to start out on a sort of a high little fitness uh, peak, something like this. And uh, yeah, most viruses will be fairly genetically similar. But over time, they'll figure out ways to start to wander, to sort of change one nucleotide on average and two and three, like the flu virus does every year, like the coronavirus is doing, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, the, every virus has its own strategy for getting from peak to peak. All right, so now let's go into the next paper. And the next paper is all about this. Here we go. So this is the fitness landscape of the HIV-1 quasi-species. Um, and uh, we're talking about just the protease uh, gene here. So we're not even talking about the rest of the virus, just what's the quasi-species got to offer in the way of proteases? And the answer is kind of interesting, because basically everything with quasi-species is actually pretty interesting. All right, so for this study, they actually looked at three different people, and they're calling these pe person M, person N, and person O. M was just recently diagnosed. N has been diagnosed for a while with HIV. And O is uh, long-term positive and actually is suffering um, immune system collapse. So O would have AIDS, M and N would have HIV, but not yet AIDS. And you can see the difference here in the amount of virus, the number of copies per milliliter is low, 17,000, 15,000, and over here in type O is 297,000. So uh, person O is one where the uh, virus seems to be winning a little bit. And so what they did was they sequenced all the viruses from inside these people, or rather, uh, I don't know, a sampling of a couple hundred viruses. And then rather than just reporting the results, which would have been interesting, but, you know, anybody with a little bit of money can do that. They actually took all of the protease differences. So every time there was a mutation in there, they made a copy of that gene and they tested it out to see how well it would work. And they found some interesting things. So here are... Um, First of all, just the family trees. You can see person M 
has all these different strains inside of them, but they share a common ancestor. And so right about back there would be the original strain that person M would have been infected with. Uh, person O, that strain would be back here, and you can see they have a cluster, and there's the cluster for person M. So yeah, all these people, you're never infected with just one virus. That's the thing with quasi-species. Because the virus mutates so quickly, you're going to be infected with that virus and every other version of that virus that's a few nucleotides different. Like every possible combination of mutations will exist inside of a human body. And so those mutations that turn regular flu into uh, severe flu will exist. At least a couple copies of those will exist uh, inside everybody when they get the flu. And it's the same with HIV. And so here they're actually going through uh, some of the uh, kinds of uh, protease they found in person M and person N and person O. And you can see we've got mutations and they're lined up in particular places. So you notice that there are particular mutations here. I think uh, you'll have to look at the paper, but these are either going to be um, a result of the strain that started out in this person just had these mutations. And so uh, they're still going to be a little more common, or maybe they were made very early on. And it's possible that some of these mutations that are quite common are also mutations that are uh, escape mutants, mutations that are caused by selection with the antivirals these uh, people would be on. But uh, down here in person O, you can see that the mutations are just scattered all over the place, just randomly. And so just looking at this, what would you predict? Who would have the fittest, fastest, best viruses? So looking at this myself, I see a lot of randomness here. And remember, random mutation does not make Spider-Man. Random mutation makes broken things, broken uh, genes. And so I would predict that this one's going to have problems. I think where you see strings of mutations, you've probably found a mutation that's not going to be a big change. So arginine to lysine is a very small change, as is uh, glutamic acid to aspartic acid, or aspartic to glutamic, rather. And so those are going to be what we call conservative changes that will probably be tolerated. But um, yeah, some of these are probably not going to be at all like that. And so then they actually um, looked where on the protease these mutations occur. And so they're all over the inside and the outside. Uh, person M seems to be selecting for uh, differences on one side of the protease. N is doing kind of the same thing, but uh, more so, same part of the uh, protein. And then person O, this is, uh, remember that bulldog confirmation with the little hole right there where the brain should be. Uh, person O is showing changes just everywhere with no real rhyme or reason. Just random mutation uh, going on there. Okay. And so then they take all these um, versions of the protease and they run them through a test and figure out how good are they compared to wild type. So if normal wild type protease is at exactly 100% right here and inactivated is at exactly 0%, then, uh, and that's the error bar, you know, for the uh, average test, then where do these things rank? And so you see some of these proteases are terrible, and some are a little better than uh, normal. And in person uh, M and person N, you've got a pretty good mix, but you tend to have a lot of fairly active proteases, maybe just a little bit less active. Person O, just look at that. It's just like random selection. A few of them work, a lot of them don't really work, and uh, yeah, if this person had an immune system, it would be cracking down on this virus, but uh, no selection, then there's no purification, and strains can just wander. But here's the really interesting thing. If you notice, so the size of the circle is going to tell you how many sequences are in there, and the distance is going to tell you how many changes they are different from a cluster. So this one is one amino acid different from this one, and it's one amino acid different from these five, and probably two amino acids different from this one. And so you can see here, most of these sequences, the greatest number of them, are clustered around the center here. And these are all at uh, somewhere between 50 and 100% um, fitness. So you can kind of imagine a three-dimensional fitness peak. So this is like a fitness ridge right over here. This is all very high over here in the green. And it goes down to a lower plateau over here in this sort of yellow area and out to there, and this yellow area and this yellow area here and here. 
And then we go just off the cliff. We go down into the uh, red and the gray and the black. And uh, these are the guys that just completely fell off the cliff that made mutations that are not, uh, not particularly useful. And so what you can see is that the quasi-species, even though it's making lots of mutations, while there's an active immune system, we are selecting for pretty good versions of this. Now, over in N, I think this is the uh, most fascinating person. So if you look at this person, the big circles that uh, have the most sequences and most of the landscape seem to be at about 25 to 50 percent efficiency, which is interesting. So person N is actually selecting for less fit versions of the uh, protease. And this may be as a result of some of the drugs that they're on, but another explanation for this is that the HIV protease doesn't necessarily want to be too fast or too good. Like highly functioning protease is actually probably suboptimal for the virus because remember the protease of HIV is involved in the last step, maturation. And if it does anything before that last maturation step, it's gonna to be too early and it's going to kill a virus particle. So slow protease is actually a little bit better. And if you can genetically mutate your protease so that it's a little bit slower, then you are probably actually getting to a fitness peak. And so we're making lots more um, little changes around here, but uh, they seem to be connected with these uh, suboptimal viruses. And then have a look at O down here. O is just crazy town. But uh, once again, in this person, we've selected for the uh, probably suboptimal for the virus, but well-functioning uh, proteases. That seems to be the center of the cloud, and you've just got this mess of all these other things. So we've got another nice little fitness landscape here. Here's our peak in the center. It's like um, that fitness landscape graph, but if you were looking straight down from on top of it, this is the tip of the mountain, and then the uh, other little valleys and peaks run off over here. Here's another little peak, this little green circle uh, over here. Just not many viruses over uh, on it at the moment. And yeah, so that's, that's one way to actually visualize how this looks. And it brings up this interesting point that maximum function isn't always what's best for the virus. So what we know from some of these other papers is that viruses will actually be fine-tuned to make a certain number of mistakes because by making a certain number of mistakes, you actually increase the chances for evolutionary shifts, even though you're making mutations, even though most of the time this is going to be bad. If you have as many offspring as your typical virus does, then it just needs one of them to work, and then bam, you've uh, made it to the next generation. That's just how viruses live. That is just how viruses roll. So a uh, really fascinating uh, paper here, I think. Uh, well worth a look. Yeah, a little older, but still a very, very good one.